uh, libraries are places where curiosity thrives all the time. We're in the curiosity business. Everybody who comes in here has a question about something or other. It may be, where's the copiers? Or it may be a big and complicated question. But one of the things that's been curious for me the last uh, few weeks as this event has drawn closer is that the approach of an event like this can make you think about the topic in a way that you might not have uh, under normal circumstances. In this case, our topic being healthcare and what's at stake for us. A few examples. Uh, Friday morning, I got an email from a colleague who was very anxious about a family member and had to rearrange a schedule. Uh, thankfully, by later that day, the situation had stabilized a little bit. Also, coincidentally, on Friday, it was the day for my annual physical exam, and uh, sometimes there's a little bit of apprehension uh, going into that. And uh, I thought in a new way about, uh, about how thorough the doctor was and about the preparation he had to have and the, and the resources he had to have at his disposal to do such a fine job and how welcome my questions were. It was worth all my apprehension to hear the doctor say at the end of that exam, keep up the good work. I don't hear that every year. <laughs> and then last night, I got a worrisome email from my homeland, Canada, where the health care is supposed to be flawless, right? And my 91-year-old my mom, uh, who's in failing health and has dementia and all kinds of other complications, had had to be admitted to a hospital. And of course, I was very anxious about this and wanted to make sure she had good care. Uh, again, I'm happy to report, I just found out since I arrived on campus, that uh, her situation is much better. A final example, this morning when I was uh, saying hello to people at church, I talked to a young man I don't know very well, but he's both uh, eager and a little bit apprehensive about becoming a father for the first time in, in August, uh, along with his wife, of course. And it's, it's just a reminder that at all phases of life, we have a stake in what our health care is and in knowing uh, how it works what our resources are, and uh, how they are extended to us. And that's a big part of why we're here this evening. So I'm so grateful to my colleagues here at the University Library who have done uh, a lot of work in setting this event up. And I'm grateful to you for joining us, and to our panelists who I look forward to hearing from along with you, and perhaps especially to the friends of the library, who sponsor this and other events in the course of the year. We're so grateful for their work. I'm going to ask the president of the Friends of the Library, uh, Professor Eric Gossett, to come up and uh, introduce the evening for us. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I, it's a good thing that God gave us two eyeballs, because some of you are way over there, and some of you are over there, and so the four speakers are going to be shaking their heads a lot, and it's not because they're upset. <laughs> Before we get started, I have one announcement, two announcements related to the Friends of the Bethel Library. Uh, the Friends is a group of people who want to support the library and help in times of limited budgets, and membership in the Friends is very inexpensive, uh, $25 a year still, I believe. And do we have a student discount? $5 or $10 for a student. Okay, so 5 or $10 for students. So you students, keep that in mind. You get a newsletter. We sponsor twice a week some little forums like this in the middle of the day, one of which I want to highlight, uh, our annual meeting. But we have every year a library research prize for students on turning in papers they've done for classes that make extensive use of the library. And this year, the competition was quite close. But the winner will be presenting her work. The winner is Matisse Murray. I had her in a class a, a couple of years ago. It was a science, technology, and society course. The paper she wrote for that class was so good, we, I had her submitted in a national contest. And she was a money prize winner in a national contest of student papers. Matisse has won again with the paper she wrote for the history department this year. Trees Nestled Among Skyscrapers, Frederick Law, Olmsted, and the Creation of Central Park. And she'll have a chance, as well as a chance to acknowledge some of the other winners of prizes related to this. Well, tonight we have four speakers we've invited, and I'm going to 
introduce them by name now and then they'll come up and maybe reintroduce themselves as they each make a presentation. Then we're going to have a time for some questions. We've passed out pieces of paper and pencil and we'll gather those, take a five minute break so we can put some nice comfortable chairs for all of them up on the stage and then have a chance for some interaction. So our guests, and, and again the, tonight this is not a debate. We're having a forum to provide information. This is the, the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare has been in the news a lot and people have been arguing about it and it was suggested to us that nobody really knows, you know, most people who are arguing about it haven't a clue what it says in any great detail. So we'd like to provide that information. So our first speaker is Ellen Benavides. She is an assistant commissioner in the Minnesota Department of Health. And Margaret Perryman is the CEO and president of Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare. Uh, third will be Professor Stacy Hunter Hecht in political science at Bethel and also a frequent guest expert on the public television almanac news program on Friday nights. And we'll finish with Margaret Schaefer, Marjorie Schaefer, who is a professor of nursing and an extensive background in public health nursing. Uh, and so we'll just put this right here. While we're doing technology, I'm curious, is there anybody here who does not have an opinion about the Affordable Care Act? <laughs> you want to see a show of hands. <laughs> okay, so you're smarter than the, the random audience. That's a good thing. So you'll keep me on my toes. I'm Ellen Benavides, Assistant Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Health. Excuse me a And... Ah, uh, gotcha, okay. And I'm here to talk both about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, as it's known to many people both uh, on both sides of the coin, as well as what we're doing here in the state of Minnesota, which is really a lot of what the Affordable Care Act was built upon, is what we've been doing here in Minnesota since at least the 90s, if not earlier, and is certainly something that I've spent the last 35 years of my life working on in one way, shape, or form. But just a little explanation of what I do at the health department, I, I find that it's really instructive to let people know what I do there because it's not a very well understood place nor is it a very well understood job. I'm responsible for quality compliance and reform which means I am responsible or my staff, 500 staff, for ensuring that any kind of care that's delivered in any kind of a health facility, be it a nursing home, an assisted living facility, a hospital, a surgical center, meets quality standards and that you as citizens can be assured that whatever is going on there for your family members and friends is, is th that they are safe. I'm also responsible for all things related to electronic health records, mortuary science, health economics, any kind of data or research that is collected and reported about the status of um, health insurance or the status of health of the Minnesota population. So it's a very obscure and unusual array of things that I'm responsible for. We also, as the state public health agency, are responsible for making sure that your drinking water, the air quality is safe, for ensuring that all kinds of prevention and healthcare programs are put in place to prevent chronic diseases and or to monitor chronic diseases. And then we have staff in place to be ready for any kind of a health emergency. So little uh, PR piece for the health department in case you didn't happen to know that that's what we do. I think people think we're a part of the Department of Human Services, which is the largest payer for care for low-income populations and the elderly in Minnesota. So I wanted to talk a little bit about health care reform in Minnesota, who, how, what, where, when, and why. So why are we doing this? I think we all know that health care costs continue to grow both nationally and in Minnesota. We have more and more Minnesotans that are uninsured. We used to have the lowest number of uninsured people in the entire nation. And since 2000, we've gone up to having 9% of the uninsured population in Minnesota as in 20, now in 2011, which is really not good. So we're starting to slip back as a state, and there's a lot of factors that come to play for that in terms of ex the uh, rising cost of health insurance, we have more and more people who have moved to our state for whom insurance isn't part of their cultural background and they're not eligible for insurance, for example. We also have a lot of fragmentation in the system. So you've got excellence on one hand 
and at the same level, people who might have access to a certain kind of care or a certain kind of provider, but then when they move from one system to the next, either the information doesn't go with them or they're not able to access those services. And so we, as a result, we have a lot of health disparities in the state as well. For example, the rate of infant mortality between black and white populations are just astronomically different. And that has to go as much to foreign-born um, populations as well as our traditional Minnesota black population. We just, we, we've got all kinds of health disparities. And increasingly, we're spending more and more time on very expensive care and less and less time on public health or preventive services that would keep people from needing the expensive care. As a result, we've got a pretty wide variation in health status. We've got some very healthy, healthy people in the state and people who, again, cannot access care and have huge health disparities and poor health outcomes. And as we continue to grow in Minnesota, um, Minnesota men are the longest lived men in the United States with women right behind them. And as we continue to age in place, we're going to see the silver tsunami hit us like we have been talking about for 30 years. But we are not prepared as a state, either in terms of having a workforce to take care of the number of elderly people who will need more and more care. Because as we live longer and longer, we tend to die of more and more complicated things. And we do not have the, we don't have the system or the infrastructure or the workforce in place. So we know we can do better. We've been talking about it for forever, at least 35 years of my life. And we're finally getting ready to do something about it as a state. So we have this vision at the state, and many of you might have heard of the concept of the triple aim, which gets to better cost, better care, and a better patient experience. And the set of bubbles that I've laid up here talk about what does better care really mean. It involves engaging communities and really enhancing the consumer experience so that when you actually see your health care practitioner, you are engaged as part of a relationship with that practitioner. It's no longer physician as God telling you what you need to do because they said so. But as more and more information is available on the internet, we have smarter and smarter consumers who are able to come into that practitioner office, ask questions, engage in a dialogue, and have a better experience as a result. We also want to have healthier communities. So not only would you be a healthier individual because the care you're getting is better, but at collectively, what is it that we as a community do that can increase the health of the entire community? Because that affects all of our bottom line and it affects all of our health status together. And in the end, that's what we need to do in order to reduce costs and to reward value. Historically, we've paid practitioners on a fee-for-service basis, so the number of things that happen to you as a patient is how the payment has happened Going forward, we want to be able to have practitioners have a different kind of financial relationship, both with you as individuals, as well as with the insurance companies and with, an, and with employers, so that practitioners are being paid for the outcome, not for the number of procedures. So this image here talks about what a, a new model of health would look like in Minnesota if we take what is in the Affordable Care Act and build on some of the earlier work we've done where we link this whole other array of services with the client at the center. So we've got primary care, we've got dental care, we've got hospital services, chemical dependency, behavioral health, dental, public health, and social services. It's again, collectively, what is it that we need to bring to bear to improve a person's health and ultimately the population's health? So I said we've been doing this for a long, long time. Back in 92, we passed a historic piece of legislation called Minnesota Care, which was a health care program for people who were not poor enough to be on Medicaid or a public program, but they were not wealthy enough to be able to buy their own insurance. And so Minnesota Care has been a very strong program for people who are both uh, childless adults and adults with children to be able to afford buying into the health care system at a reduced price and to bear their own burden. We've also had a, a Minnesota Eliminating Health Disparities Program, which is a program run out of the health department. And that program focuses resources and technical support and assistance to a whole array of <coughs> community nonprofits that helps them help different population groups who are usually outside of the main 
outside and not very well served by the mainstream healthcare system. We also created in 2008 as part of a broad bipartisan set of health reforms um, called Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Health Reforms of 2008, the Statewide Health Improvement Program. And it's a very community-based program where schools and employers and clinics and anybody else in a community that wants to really change um, how funds are spent and go upstream to keep people healthier in some pretty unique ways. So farm to school lunch programs, for example, or having employers offer wellness programs to their employees. That statewide health impro improvement program, we believe at the health department, is at core what we're going to need to build on going forward to reduce health care expenditures and keep communities healthier. So in March of 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed. It involved in Minnesota a very quick expansion of the Medicaid program for 80, 84,000 people, which used to be single adults called the General Assistance Medical Care Program. And that was one of the first things that Governor Dayton did when he was elected was to expand enrollment. And then the U.S. Supreme Court just this past year um, said that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. Let's just get on with things, stop squabbling about it. How are we going to implement this across the board? So my slide a bit. This is my first PowerPoint, so I don't do this usually. So I don't like this. <coughs> Eek. I'm just going to hit all these buttons and then I'll have everything there that I want. There. So, what I'm trying to do is interrelate the Minnesota reforms with the Federal Affordable Care Act so you can see how they align. So, for example, we have tax credits for the affordable private insurance for people between 133 and 400% of poverty. And those will be available through the exchange, which just passed in Minnesota after two years of debate. We now have something called Minsure, which sounds a little bit like a dietary supplement. <laughs> but that's what we're calling our exchange in Minnesota. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the exchange. We also have this option to expand Medicaid and eligibility and enrollment. There's the piece that is probably one of the two most controversial out of the Affordable Care Act. And that is for uh, individuals to have to purchase their own insurance. That will go into effect January 2014. <clears throat> There's a whole host of insurance reforms, which include things like um, uh, young adults up to age 26 can stay on their parents' health insurance now. And again, in Minnesota, we already had that in place up to age 25. So we're kind of, uh, ahead, of this, ahead of the nation in some ways and behind the nation in some other ways, but particularly for youth, that was huge. Um, other things like not allowing an insurance company to discriminate against you if you have a prior health condition. So if you're pregnant, that's considered a health condition. If you have some kind of a chronic condition or a disease or an illness, you could be, um, you, uh, what's the word I want? you could be denied insurance coverage. That will no longer be the case starting in 2014. There's a whole host of payment and quality reforms, which, which again, we started here in Minnesota in, 20, in 2008. For example, we have all practitioners have a requirement to submit quality data to us, the State Health Department, and we in turn present that information both back to them so that they can be aware of their own clinical practices and their patterns and improve their quality of care, but we also will start reporting it publicly next year which will be a way for the public to have better information with which to choose either a provider or a health care system. A lot of focus on prevention in the Affordable Care Act, which again builds on what we've been doing in Minnesota. <coughs> Specifically, things like having <coughs> access to a whole array of services, both if you're on Medicare and if you are a part of the individual market. So you can receive uh, all kinds of family, practice, or family planning services, uh, blood pressure checks, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, there will be a whole switch in the way the feds are dealing with Medicare. So for example, and I know Mark is probably <coughs> going to talk about hospital readmissions and what that really means to the hospital, so I'll leave that there. So these are all pieces of the, the reform. And in terms of what's happened in Minnesota so far, uh, we've had the donut hole. Some of you might, some of you look like you might be on Medicare. So the Medicare Part D donut hole, 
you've been able to fill that donut hole and receive funds so that you're not sort of stuck without funds to be able to pay for some of your prescription drugs. I've already mentioned the early expansion of medical assistance. Again, the prevention, diabetes, the prevention initiatives, which includes a focus on diabetes in particular. We all know that as we become more and more obese and as we become less and less healthy as a state and as a nation, the cost of diabetes is going to be, in addition to the age weight, something that is going to totally break our system. So to the degree we can focus in both engaging people to get more exercise, better nutrition, as well as uh, talking with peers to support each other to adopt healthier lifestyles, that's going to save us a lot of money. These community transfer gr transformation grants build on that SHIP program, the statewide health improvement program I mentioned, and that will allow us to go again upstream and work in communities to figure out different ways for communities to support their own health. I talked about some of the preventive services, the mam mammograms and colonoscopies. I talked about um, some of the insurance reforms, but there's also not going to be a lifetime limit anymore. Often people can be bankrupt. If you have a health, um, health disaster, or not even that bad of a health disaster, you could be wiped out financially. And so as health insurance plans have lifetime limits, as we remove those, that's going to really change the financial dynamic. And then community clinics, which tend to be local community-based <coughs> clinics that provide services more for low-income people than not, but also a lot of students um, are getting lots of bricks and mortar support, technical assistance, and uh, additional funds for their workforce. So going into the future, I just want to re-emphasize like a broken record, it's about health, not health care. We know that about 10% of the factors that really contribute to a person's health happen in the healthcare setting. The rest of it, the environment, genetics, behavior, your family um, environment, all of those other pieces of your life have huge impacts on your health status and on the, the amount of money you spend for healthcare. So we as, a, as a, an agency and as part of the Dayton administration are really trying to change the conversation so that it's not health care reform, it's about reforming health and thinking about all of those other services. So then there's this exchange, which um, is usually the other most controversial part of the Health Reform Act. The exchange is supposed to be a uh, kind of a Expedia.com of the insurance system. And it's supposed to be a web-based, very friendly shopping experience so that you, as an individual, you, if you are on one of the public programs meeting medical assistance, or if you, as an employee, um, working in an employer setting with 50 or fewer employees, can have rational, quick, ready, simple to understand information about how to choose a plan, how to choose a physician, how to choose a team of practitioners. And this exchange, I said, just got passed in our state legislature last month. It is in the process of being set up. It's been a target politically for the last two years because there is, I think, at core a belief that it's costing a lot of money to set up a very fancy IT web page. <coughs> it's controversial because it looks like socialism, depending on your perspective. It's controversial because it's part of the gateway to individual responsibility for health care. And that has, again, two sides of a coin. So I want to talk a little bit more about the exchange. And I'm never using a clicker again. Okay. <laughs> so I think that the important piece here is that because the exchange will be this marketplace, they're going to really be controlling the costs that insurers can be charging you for your coverage. And by that I mean costs should be lower. There are tax subsidies for people at a certain income level. It's supposed to be more sane, rational, clear. And that quality information will be available to you. So you're not just shopping blindly. You're shopping with a lot of information. And again, I think one of the odd controversies that's going to come to play when it goes live, open enrollment starts October this year, but it goes live live, meaning you know, something is actually happening in January is as people are shopping, 
that exchange will have a lot of personal information because you're going to be asked to provide information. And so data privacy advocates are very uncomfortable about the fact that there's going to be an exchange. There will be all kinds of security provisions built into it so data doesn't leak. But how many of us read about some data breach or some data leak somewhere? So again, there will be some anxiety and some controversy. And I just have to bring this picture because it's so outrageous. This is what the exchange is really going to look like. This is the skunk works. So all this information from consumers, from state agencies, from the feds, there will be IRS information in there, information from the Homeland Security Department at the federal level. So somewhere behind the screen, everybody will be able to look at a very friendly face. There will be navigators that will be hired to help people who don't speak English or aren't web savvy. So the face is intended to be very friendly, but behind the screen, there is a huge machine back there, and people, again, who are nervous about black boxes have a lot of black boxes to look at. I already mentioned the three different audiences that should have their relationship with the exchange. And the timeline for the exchange is it goes live January of 2014. So the state has received $100 million over the last year to design all the IT infrastructure and the software and the hardware. So there have been many, many, many people involved in developing all of these health reforms in Minnesota and figuring out how to implement the Affordable Care Act here. And from a citizen's perspective, the governor had a task force that had four different sub-work groups to talk about workforce, to talk about access, to talk about um, the exchange, and to talk about public health and prevention. And there were hundreds of people involved over a year and a half long period. There's a report available, and you can avail it on the last page. There's a whole set of web links. That report is huge and has now kind of sitting quietly because we're in the middle of a legislative session. And there are other topics for the legislature to be debating. But once the session is over, the hundreds of recommendations in this, this uh, draft Roadmap to a Healthier Minnesota are to be implemented by various state agencies and other groups who are interested. There was also the Citizens League and Bush Foundation Citizen Solution process where 1,400 people were involved in focus groups around the state to talk about what they envisioned or wanted to see happen as we in Minnesota adopted the Affordable Care Act. And I think the most striking thing that they said was, we're not interested in talking about health care. We're interested in talking about health. You need to give us, me, citizens, information so that we're not in the dark about what it is you're talking about and decisions that are being made on my behest. And so I think as one of the state agencies responsible, I take that very seriously. And that's why on a Sunday night, even though it's kind of crappy outside, I wanted to come talk with you because I think the more information you have, the more facts you have, about what is included in the Affordable Care Act and what we're doing here in Minnesota, you're going to be all that more well positioned to say, yay, nay, this is how I'd like it to work and this is how I want it to work for me. So here's a bunch of websites if you want to track anything going on in health reform. These are great sites both locally and nationally. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over to, Mar to Margaret. Well, thank you very much. My name is Margaret Perryman. I'm the CEO at Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare in St. Paul. And I know we have a relationship with the nursing department here at Bethel, and I know we've hired a number of nurses from Bethel, so someday we may see some of you in, our, in my own institution. Um, I also want to tell you that I'm here because, uh, uh, partly because Carol Craig, who is one of the librarians here, and I went to high school together. So <laughs> she uh, called me up and asked how I'd help with this, and I was uh, certainly glad to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit about the hospital's point of view as far as the Affordable Care Act. Um, the, uh, and I, excuse me for just a second, I need to find my talk. Way to do it. 
Do you know when you're staying in front of a bunch of people? <laughs> Not as easy. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking from the hospital's point of view about the Affordable Care Act. Um, so uh, I want to uh, spend. Uh, I'm going to focus on three areas: why hospitals support this reform. What are the issues and impacts to hospitals that we're looking at forward? And I know hospitals are just a tiny little bit of health, as, as uh, Ellen talked about. But 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 this is but we are one of the major um, uh, cost impacts on uh, on health on healthcare reform and 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 on the healthcare dollar that all of you spend every year. So. Uh, hospitals are paying very close attention to this. We've been very involved, hospitals have been very involved in, in, in how this is set up in the first place. I, uh, the, uh, there were many different stakeholders brought in to try and shape this health reform in such a way that would really m begin to meet the problems and, and issues that we have in our country related to health. Um, and the other thing I'm going to talk about is what changes, what are, so what are hospitals doing related to health care uh, as we all go down this road together? So first of all, why do hospitals support the, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act? And I think probably the most important, probably the primary reason is there were, there are, there were, or there still are, 45 million people who are uninsured in, in the United States. If you don't, if you're uninsured, you have a very difficult time uh, accessing health care. And so some of the things that the Affordable Care Act has done will help all of us actually be able to, in, to access health care because we now have access to insurance. So first of all, most, many people who do not, who are uninsured, are, are uninsured because they work for a small employer that doesn't have insurance available. They're uninsured because they are, not because they're not poor, because po there are programs for people who are very poor, but for people who are middle, you know, who are just above the poverty line, who are most, 60% uh, uh, of people who are uninsured actually have full-time jobs, but they do not have ac access to health care because of their, uh, because they work for a small company or they have a pre-existing condition. Just a, 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 this is kind of an interesting story about pre-existing conditions. I have a friend who used to work for a, a, a hospital in town uh, that's owned by a large healthcare company. And uh, so he decided to retire early, retired three years early, went to apply for, uh, he was going to buy his own health insurance until he hits Medicare, um, <coughs> hits age 65, and was denied because he had a hernia that was that he had never had it, you know, it was not it was not wasn't a hernia that caused him any problems, so he didn't have it fixed. He was denied health insurance by the company that he worked for. Uh, and, and and but in 2014, this problem will go away. But that's that's an example of somebody who is uninsured who had all the intentions in the world to buy insurance, but so. So people who are uninsured are very uh, they have intentions of being of, of wanting to be insured, but they cannot uh, uh, access insurance for what, one reason or another. So under the Affordable Care Act, we are going to be eliminating pre-existing conditions as a barrier to insurance. So my friend will be able to get health health insurance. Um, people or children under 26 will be able to continue coverage or uh, on their family insurance that takes care of many of you in this room. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to be expanding, and, and, and Ellen talked about this, expanding Medicaid to, to include people below 133% of poverty. And what's po so what's the level of poverty? If you are a, a single person, the level of poverty is $11,000 a year annual income. If you're a family of four, poverty is $23,500. Uh, of income. So those people below uh, that poverty level will be able to have access to insurance through Medicaid. 
And then in addition, there will be the availability of subsidized insurance through the health insurance exchanges that Ellen talked about. That's for people between 133% and 400% of poverty. So about 400% of poverty, <coughs> depending on his family, somewhere in the 50 to $65,000 range. So what this allows then is for people who are working, full-time jobs, work in uh, small employers, or are, aren't able to access health care for one reason or another, will now be able to be uh, in insured. And <clears throat> um, so why does insurance matter? I, I talked a little bit about that before. I, uh, so in order to have health care, uh, your access to health care is significantly lower for people who are uninsured. Uh, uninsured people have have significant financial consequences if they do become ill or if they do seek health care. In 2010, 30 uh, there were thir uh, there was 30 billion dollars in expense expenditures out of pocket from people who were uninsured or underinsured. Underinsured. And remember, these are folks that are probably I mean these are not wealthy people. These are people in the middle class to lower middle class, and they're having to spend 30 billion dollars out of pocket. But in addition, there was around uh, 57 million dollars or billion dollars spent um, that was uncompensated. People would not be able to pay their bill, and this was either uh, uh, about 43 billion that became the responsibility of the federal government, and another 13 billion dollars was hospitals giving away free care. So um, this is a significant, nearly a hundred billion dollars of care that people uh, that are people either having to pay for themselves or is not being paid for because people are uninsured. So um, and I can tell you as a as a healthcare administrator the idea of having to take people to court and all the other things that we uh, are expected to do to get people to pay <coughs> for the health care bill is really distasteful for us. So making sure that people are fully insured um, is really the uh, uh, is really important so that people can have access to care and not have to uh, make decisions about whether they have health care or whether they feed their kids this, this month. So it just these are just some uh, uh, slides that show uh, the barriers to health care among the non elderly. These are people who are 18 to 20, 64 years of age. Uh, people who are uninsured do not have a usual source of care. That's that 55 uh, percent mark on the top. They don't have preventive care. About 42% of people who are uninsured in this age group have no preventative care. They went without needed care uh, due to costs. About 26% of people who are uninsured uh, went without care. And they couldn't afford prescription drugs, about 27%. And this is people in the uh, mid-ages, not, not elderly. Uh, and then what are the co financial consequences of medical bills by insurance status? So people who are um, uh, uninsured, that's that light blue mark, the 22% on the left-hand side, had been collected, had been contacted by a collection agency by about their medical bills. They were basically getting those horrible phone calls every day, are you going to pay your bill? Um, and th another 14% were uh, unable to pay for basic necessities to, due to a medical bill. Um, they had to make decisions about whether or not they were going to uh, you know, basically pay the heat, light, and power, and other, you know, the, and buy food in order to pay their medical bill. And about 20% of the uninsured have used up all or most of their savings in order to pay the bill. And this does not even talk about the people who, uh, um, who basically had to file bankruptcy in order to pay a health care bill. So the, the, the Affordable Care Act has a lot of purposes, but one of the major purposes is to make sure that people have access to insurance so they can have access to reasonable health care needs. So why do hospitals support, support a, a Accountable Care Act, well, Affordable Care Act? Uh, cer certainly, uh, we want to make sure people are insured so that we can provide care and not have to um, um, you know, put people through extraordinary means in order to have them pay care when we know they don't even have the money. Um, there are also a lot of things that are going on in the Affordable Care Act that help, that I think put hospitals and sent us to do the right things. Um, I, I can tell you that before this passed, I sat in many, many meetings of my colleagues where we were talking about things that we wanted to do in order to improve the health of people that, that for whom we were providing care.
but we were unable to do this because it's not it wasn't being paid for. And certainly, <coughs> I will tell you, hospitals do a lot of work that's not paid for. We do a lot of what we refer to as community benefit work. We do health uh, uh, health fairs and and uh, uh, screening the blood pressure, all kinds of things. But you can only go so far. Uh, in, in, to provide these kinds of things for free without having some sort of source of revenue for at least some things. So uh, we spent lots of time, we over the years spent lots of times talking about how much more we could do if there were more resources available to us. And this is especially true in the 800 small communities in Minnesota where the hospital or the physician is the major provider of health and in that community and want and want to do more, but the resources just weren't there. Um, so some of the things that go on now with uh, with under the for, who that will be uh, it will be able to do more. We'll be able to do focus more on wellness as as Ellen talked about uh, care coordination. Ellen talked about the fact that people, that we really have a system that's very. Um, uh, uh, People go. People do, there's not an organized system. People go many different places. They have many different things going on, and there's nobody really coordinating the care. Well, hospitals will probably end up doing a lot more care coordination, which would be a very important thing for us to do. And then, in addition, we'll spend, we'll take hospitals along with the physicians in our communities. We'll uh, be in the forefront of taking on additional responsibilities for the health status of the community. Um, and I think the other reason why hospitals uh, support the Affordable Care Act is that we knew that the system is not was, the old system was not sustainable. We could see we saw all the data that showed the in you know that health health and health care was going to be eating the uh, uh, you, the United States budget and the budget of the state of Minnesota alive unless something else happened. <clears throat> So what are the issues and impacts on hospitals? And there are going to be, this is going to be, this is complicated and it's going to be difficult for us as, a, uh, as hospitals, but, but I think we're all engaged in trying to uh, uh, address these issues as quickly as we can. Uh, there are going to be significant changes to hospital business models. It, this is the, the Affordable Care Act really, and, and, and what Minnesota is doing, is, as Ellen talked about, really looks at how do we focus on health. We need to have a holistic and community-based approach to the work that we're getting, rather the work that we're doing, rather than focusing on sick people. Um, there will we will take more accountability for health for wellness in our community and you know this is um, and I know that many of you for small are, are from small towns and I think small town hospitals have always done a pretty good job in this arena but they can only do a limited amount so I think this is a great exciting time in my mind if I were running a small uh, community hospital because there are so many things that community hospitals will be able to do for their wellness of their community. We're going to become patient-centered rather than disease-centered. We're not going to be take, uh, uh, treating heart disease. We're going to be treating people who have a lot of issues, including heart disease. And that's the important part. You focus on heart disease. You, uh, for most of us, we have other issues that are all coming into play here. Uh, uh, mental health issues, and, 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 and we need rehabilitation, all kinds of things related to heart disease. So hospitals now will be focusing on the holistic needs of that patient, not just their heart disease. Um, uh, physician compensation, one of the major changes that are, are going to happen with Affordable Care Act is that physician compensation, will, based on procedures, will begin to decrease. You know, right now that's one of the biggest uh, comments that people have about about health care, and that is that the only way physicians get paid is by doing things, doing surgery, uh, doing you know, doing procedures. Well, we're moving away from a procedure-based compensation program to um, a more of a holistic uh, base. And part of the part of what's happening behind the scenes is that hospitals and physicians are are coming together in in, in, in collaborative ways. And in fact, 70% of physicians in the United States now are salaried either by a hospital or a large medical practice that is co is connected to a hospital. Um, and then hospital reimbursements are going to be focused on best practices. So we're going to have to do a lot of hard work 
to figure out how to what what are the best practices and incorporate them into our institutions. Will no longer it will no longer be acceptable for us to uh, take care of patients in a certain way because that's the way we've always been doing it. Um, or because somebody thinks, or we do something because somebody thinks it's a better way. Now we need to gather the evidence and develop our, 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 our services so that we are using the best practices. I was uh, talking to a group of employees at Gillette uh, a year ago, and as I was talking about this, I started, you know, it just kind of came to me. You know, this is the most exciting time in healthcare because we now, I believe, are really focusing on the right things, the things that we need to focus on to to uh, carry out our responsibilities to our communities. So, those of you who are, are looking at nursing and other aspects of healthcare, you this will be a very exciting time for you to work. <clears throat> Um, there are all, but there are also workforce challenges, and, uh, and one of the major workforce challenges for us is going to be prep provider availability. And Ellen mentioned it as well. The aging, aging boomer, baby boomers will increase demand for health care. It's just part of it. You know, we spend most of our health care dollars as we after, after we hit 65. So there's a whole bunch of us that's, you know, the, the rat in the belly of the snake, baby boomers, uh, who are going to be hitting that age 65 and have, have need more health care, have, have to rely on health care. So we as uh, hospitals and other providers are going to have to figure out how to make sure that we have enough people pro to provide health care as um, the baby boomer ages. In fact, in some of the major, provi uh, major providers, physicians and uh, nursing, uh, about 50% of our workforce will be re will be retired 10 years from now. At the same time, um, so uh, uh, the aging baby boomers are going to increase the demand while they're all retiring. So uh, this is going to be a huge issue for hospitals. We'll, we're looking at ways that we can solve that problem by use of physician extenders because we just cannot employ we cannot train and employ physicians quickly enough to meet this need. So uh, there will be, uh, we will, uh, there's a growing uh, use of physician extenders in most hospitals already uh, in the United States. However, there's a pipeline problem, and that is the hiring is slow currently, and I'm looking at all of you, and I knew there would be nursing students in the audience, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm gonna find a job. Hiring is slow currently, however, uh, we have to build education capacity for future needs. So we're right now uh, graduating a lot of nurses and other uh, disciplines in healthcare before the, uh, and that, that's a good thing because we're going to need you, but the hiring is slow. So, you, uh, so my advice to you is to hang in there, keep working, keep looking for jobs. There will be jobs opening up. I can tell you there are a number of nurses in my own institution that are going to be retiring in the next year. So the, op the jobs, are the, the baby boom generation, uh, the beginning of it is just hitting 65. People are going to be retiring, so hang in there. Uh, there will be work for you. There will be plenty of work for you. Um, other issues and impacts for hospitals, uh, our reimbursement methodology will definitely change. Um, we need to develop new models of care. The old models that we have are, are, prep, are not going to work for the future. Um, the, the health plans and insurance will continue to be prevalent, the prevalent ways for people to access health care, and we have to work very closely with our uh, brothers and sisters who are in the health care, the health plan and insurance industry. And, um, and, I, uh, and the importance of electronic records. Uh, we all, hospitals, have taken on the challenge of bringing electronic records into our, into our hospitals. I can tell you, my personal opinion, the hospitals were ready. The electronic record companies were not. And uh, it was a huge challenge for us. And if any of you have gone to a doctor or, or to the hospital recently, I'm sure somebody, if somebody has said the system is down or the system isn't working, we can't get this done or whatever. We have a huge challenge for us right now in trying to deal with electronic records. But it is really critical that we do this. Current, it is really critical because this is the only way we're going to have the information available to help us then turn around and do a better job 
job to make sure that our community is healthier. And so it, this is a very difficult work. It is very expensive, but it is what needs to happen. We need to, tr to move from a transaction-based electronic record to a, a information and knowledge-based record, record. And that's um, a major em em emphasis on hospitals right now. So the other things that we're doing is that we're looking at best practices. We want to drive er error and hospital cause infections down to zero. Minnesota has a very, very good track record in this. In fact, we are, this Minnesota is the safest uh, state in the United States for you to be hospitalized and being taken care of by, the, by physicians and other health care providers in, uh, in Minnesota. So you live and work in a very, very good state. Um, as far as errors go, but we're continuing to improve because we have Ellen bringing, bringing down our backs, our, our necks telling us, we want better, we want better. Right, Ellen? <laughs> um, and the physician hospital collaborations are going to be really important. I talked about community based care delivery and care coordination. Well, the only thing more intimidating than having to talk to the hometown crowd is having to be on a panel with three experts in the field when you are not one of them. So um, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, uh, the friends asked me to talk a little bit about the politics of health care uh, reform. Uh, my expertise is in American politics and um, political um, and public policy. Um, so health care is certainly something I pay attention to, but I don't claim any particular expertise in the field. And I'm going to try and shorten things up a little bit so we stay on time here this evening, but <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about four, four things this evening. The first is to just um, paint a little bit of a picture <clears throat> on what the history of this policy area has been like, um, just real briefly. Uh, secondly, talk about um, passage of the bill, uh, talk a little bit about the Supreme Court decision, and then talk about prospects for um, political uh, implementation in the future. So that's what I've got on deck this evening. So uh, a four minute uh, 20th century political history of health care. <laughs> Uh, and the subtitle could be, The More Things Change, The More They Stay the Same, or Politics Ain't Being Bad. Your favorite, uh, you can pick. Um, both things are uh, terribly true. Um, party politics has been the order of the day, and um, we can go all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt's administration with his proposal for a national health care plan. Um, the story of the 20th century has, in a uh, large case, uh, in this policy area, been one of partisan politics. Um, I wanted to play um, two quick audio pieces for you um, uh, that are a discussion about the Medicare program in 1965 by um, then President Lyndon Johnson and then Governor of California Ronald Reagan. Um, see if this sounds at all familiar to you. One of the traditional methods of imposing statism or socialism on a people has been by way of medicine. It's very easy to disguise a medical program as a humanitarian project. Most people are a little reluctant to oppose anything that suggests medical care for people who possibly can't afford it. Now, the American people, if you put it to them about socialized medicine and gave them a chance to choose, would unhesitatingly vote against it. So there's Reagan in 65 talking about Medicare. Um, Here's some Lyndon Johnson and some tapes that um, uh, uh, David Blumenthal and James Marone have, um, have just written a book about here um, a couple years ago on uh, healthcare politics in the Oval Office. This is Johnson giving instruction to uh, the, a young Ted Kennedy uh, about how to get the bill passed. A health program yesterday runs $300 million, but the fools had to go to projecting it down the road five or six years. And when you project the first year, it runs nine hundred million. Now I don't know whether I would approve nine hundred million the second year or not. I might uh, approve four fifty or five hundred. But the first thing Dick Russell comes running in and says, "My God, you've got a billion dollar program for next year on health. Therefore, I'm against any of it now." You follow me? <laughs> so this is Johnson talking about the really the politics of passage, and um, the Congressional Budget Office is much more careful now about. Um, 
uh, verifying cost estimates of programs, and Johnson probably under current circumstances wouldn't have been able to get Medicare um, passed. Um, but echoes of today, um, uh, echoes of yesterday, uh, certainly being heard today in the debate. A couple of other things just to talk about. Um, special interests, long been the story as well. Um, in uh, the creation of the New Deal and the Social Security Act in 1935, healthcare was certainly discussed. Um, the American Medical Association uh, had a, uh, launched a campaign and um, actually was taking out um, uh, advertisements and conducting quite an information campaign with regard to um, their, um, their opposition to any national health care uh, plan um, versus the American College of Surgeons, which actually was in favor of it uh, at, at about this time. So it was viewed as a non-starter and didn't end up being part of the New Deal. Um, I'll skip showing these, but, um, but the insurance companies have certainly played a role in all of this uh, all the way along. And uh, those of us that uh, are not students now might remember back to the 1990s and the Harry and Louise ads that aired um, that, um, that were, uh, the, the slogan was, they choose, you lose. Uh, and uh, these were funded by the Health Insurance Association of America. So certainly been a big player in this debate um, all along. Finally, the public, and um, this is an interesting one. I wanted to show you some recent research um, that a, a young political scientist that I've been uh, following has been doing, and, and I, I thought this was really intriguing. This is a difficult area for the public to understand. Um, healthcare policy is probably one of the trickier ones, and so I, we're so fortunate to have the experts here this evening to, to talk to us about it. Um, this is some data that um, Jason uh, Reifler and um, Brendan Nyam and Peter Yuval have been working on. Um, they have been working on correction of public perceptions to error uh, with political information. And what this chart shows is um, a paper that these results were just published here about a month or two ago in a, a journal called Medical Care. Um, they um, gave su their subjects in this experiment, uh, members of the public, um, a piece to read about um, uh, the death panels claim uh, that Sarah Palin had made uh, with, uh, in, the, in the healthcare debate. Um, they, they read the piece, and then they gave them uh, a piece which corrected, um, corrected the story. And what they found in the public was something really intriguing. Um, what they found was, on the one hand, um, when people read the correction, that, um, that uh, those who had negative uh, perceptions of Palin, uh, unfavorable perceptions of Palin, um, regardless of knowledge, that there was some level of correction. What was most interesting was for those that had favorable uh, opinions towards Palin, um, that um, the, um, for those that had low knowledge, and you see those results on the left-hand side of the screen, so this is low levels of general political knowledge as assessed by an independent measure. What they found was that those folks, um, when they read the correction uh, to the information, um, responded to the correction. So you can see the arrow there on the right-hand side of that chart and, and the difference. Um, and, um, and we've got a significant difference there once they were subjected to the, the correction. For those with high amounts of political knowledge, however, it ran in exactly the opposite direction. Um, so, so what this really suggests is it's very hard to correct misinformation once it gets out there in the public. Um, and that some of the most knowledgeable are actually the most susceptible to myth. So um, it's a really interesting result, and I think it speaks to some of the difficulty that we're having as a society, having a conversation. Um, we tend to hold these beliefs, hold them really deeply, hold them for reasons that aren't necessarily um, entirely clear and, uh, and, and prove to be fairly uh, intractable with respect to correction. I want to talk a little bit about passage that I mentioned this to you, and um, four things to talk about here. Um, first were the Obama team rules heading into this round of reform, and they were significant. Um, this is from a, a book that um, I recommend to all of you um, that the Washington Post pulled together from their coverage of this um, debate that, that was really quite good. Um, four rules that they took on. Um, don't write the bill. Um, this was a mistake uh, that was made by the Clinton, uh, Clintons um, that they allowed Hillary Clinton to write the bill. Um, um, and so um, the, they didn't want the bill coming from the White House. The White House, the bill needed to come from the legislature. Second, to focus on middle class and corporate concerns. Um, you might think about this as not making a 47% mistake. Um, they wanted this to not get painted as uh, a problem of the uninsured, but rather get painted as a problem of the middle class uh, and a problem for corporations as well, including insurance corporations. Um, take advantage of the honeymoon, um, act fast, right? get this done in the early part of the president's term. We know presidents are more successful in those early days of their terms, and so act fast. And then neutralize the opposition. And this gets back to the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, deals galore. Um, so a um, couple deals to talk about here. Um, 
You might think about these deals as either a, re a reverse or a muffling of some of the interest that got activated in 1994 around this debate. Um, providers were important here. Uh, providers uh, got the message that reform would pay. Um, the American Medical Association got behind this bill uh, with promises of um, um, significant compensation for physicians. They weren't entirely happy. It didn't eliminate scheduled cuts in, um, in payment for, uh, for docs. It also didn't eliminate, um, it, the Senate bill actually ended up uh, creating a commission um, that, would, that may end up being uh, more tricky to work with than Congress would be. Um, but but significant, um, significant neutralization of providers here. Drug companies were important too. Um, pharma, uh, the, the um, interest group that represents the pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, conceded to decrease drug, drug prices um, and, uh, and some rules about competition, but uh, stand to reap billions uh, by virtue of the increase in insurance, right? That more people are going to have access to health insurance and therefore be able to purchase drugs. Um, private health insurance companies were also um, an interesting one here. There were flares of negative press, and there were sort of moments where um, the White House used them as kind of a, a straw man, but, uh, but eliminating the possibility of, um, of uh, a public option uh, really sort of gets them on board. Um, there were 48 amendments to the Senate bill. Um, uh, Senator Rockefeller um, said that uh, while, um, while they might not be, um, the, the private interests might not have been in the room, they were certainly present nonetheless as these amendments were being written. Um, um, and at the end of the day, um, it was interesting that the insurance uh, lobbies uh, were concerned that there was, in a sense, too little government. Um, they were concerned when it looked like those uh, coverage rates and the individual mandate wasn't going to be severe enough, right? Because they want to make sure that everybody has to buy insurance. Um, so, so it was intriguing, uh, intriguing there. Um, outside pressure, but little inside pressure from citizens and citizen groups. Um, it was interesting this time around. Um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> we don't see the public uh, well represented, particularly in this debate. Um, to the extent that we see outside interests mobilizing on the left and the right, they probably made it impossible for members of some of the Republican caucus in particular to ever vote for the bill, uh, but, uh, but didn't have much impact on the design of the bill itself. Fourth, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, Scott Brown's election. Um, the joke about Scott Brown's election, he of course was elected to replace uh, Senator Ted Kennedy after Kennedy's death, um, and it was seen as a huge turnover in that seat. Uh, Kennedy, a longtime Democratic uh, senator from Massachusetts, and uh, Brown a Republican. And the joke, of course, uh, the Village Voice headline was that Scott Brown gave the GOP a 41-59 majority in the Senate. That's a joke, right? right. 41 -59. No math, there's, a, there's at least one math prof here. There are no math majors in the crowd, I guess. But, um, right. um, so uh, this election, however, galvanizes the Democratic ticket. Um, at, and at the end of 2009, there's a bill in the Senate that's been passed. Um, it's got to still get through the House. And the concern was, oh, now what are we going to do with a reconciliation bill when it comes back to the Senate because there was no filibuster-proof majority anymore after Scott Brown's election in July of 2010. Uh, what happens was, instead, there's kind of a retrenchment um, in the Democratic Party. In February, uh, WellPoint, one of the big um, insurance, uh, national insurance companies, announced in California a 39% increase in rates, and that was sufficient to galvanize political support. And so we go forward and use a word that um, gets used only in Washington in this fashion, um, reconciliation, uh, which in fact meant that what, what the way the deal went down was of course that the House voted on the Senate version of the bill that had been passed uh, on Christmas Eve 2009 with a sidecar bill with all of the taxation and funding in it that was then passed by the Senate on reconciliation measure which is used for budget, uh, for budget um, bills. And so then we get to March and, um, and the health care bill passes. Um, the next political story, of course, to tell is that of the Supreme Court decision, and I'll try to keep this uh, quick as well. Um, the court was asked to rule this summer on two major issues. There were a couple small issues as well, um, but the two major ones were the individual mandate that's part of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion. The um, individual mandate is, of course, the mandate that everybody has to purchase um, insurance. And the Medicaid expansion had to do with what um, Ellen and Margaret have both talked about, which was the states having to expand um, the, um, the, the range of folks to which um, are, have access to, medical, to Medicaid coverage. Um, the penalty attached to that initially was that if states didn't do it, they stood to lose all of their Medicare uh, funding from the federal government. 
Um, so the Supreme Court rules on these two issues. They rule on the individual mandate. They uphold the individual mandate as being constitutional. They uphold it kind of intriguingly. Um, they uphold it on a five to four majority with Chief Justice John Roberts voting with the majority and writing the majority opinion. Uh, of the five that voted in the majority, um, Justice Roberts was the only one who uh, defended its constitutionally, constitutionality on only one ground, and that was on the ground of um, Congress's ability to tax. Uh, the other four justices, the liberal bloc, would have upheld the law uh, also under the Interstate Commerce Clause. So for court watchers, we still have an open question on the uh, scope of the Interstate Commerce Clause. Um, on the Medicaid expansion question, um, similarly, the, f the five to four majority ruled that um, the expansion was constitutional, but not the, uh, not the procedure to eliminate funding for the rest if they didn't expand it. So kind of le lessen the, um, the potential punishment. Um, uh, political scientists like to look at this kind of stuff. Um, Roberts voted with a liberal block in this five to four decision for the first time since his appointment in 2005. Uh, we've, got a, um, we've got a conservative block on the court right now. And it was interesting to see Roberts hop on over while well, Anthony Kennedy, um, who, is a, who is the swing justice on the court right now, um, voted with the conservatives. Um, he's voted with the liberal bloc 25 times since 2005 and is widely considered to be the, um, the swing justice. So kind of interesting politics on the court uh, with respect to their decision um, in this case. So that's this summer. I was in uh, Beijing when the decision was announced, had an interesting conversation about that across the pond, as it were, across the other pond. So a couple of political uh, implications to think about here. Um, entrenchment. Um, talk just a bit about policy entrenchment. What makes a policy sort of part of the national fabric? Um, our cycle of entrenchment with respect to public policy has really sped up recently. Um, Social Security passes in 1935. It's probably not until the 50s till it's really woven into our fabric, and then probably the 70s until it's this sort of deep, deep expectation about American life. But as the media cycle speeds up, um, as the information cycle speeds up, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with respect to this policy area and, in, and entrenchment. Does this become part of the expectations that we have? There's a policy learning cycle, and, um, and we may be on an accelerated path to having this be, be something that uh, took an awfully long time to pass, but now that it's passed, sort of becomes part of the national fabric. Secondly, I think um, something we want to pay attention to are implementation issues, and these are um, over an interpretation of the law. Um, compromises happen when we pass legislation, and some of those compromises uh, entail the use of ambigu ambiguous language. And how that ambiguous language gets resolved really involves um, uh, two parts of the federal government, uh, the bureaucracy, in this case, Department of Health and Human Services, and also um, the U.S. Congress. And so uh, interest groups are certainly lined up on this issue. Um, lawyers are lined up on this issue. They know where the ambiguities are. Um, and um, Despite there being some um, bureaucratic discretion, um, it's certainly the case that Congress um, retains discretion as well, and um, and we'll be uh, we'll be hearing from people who have a stake in how the law is put into place. Um, repeal attempts, and there's been some discussion about this, um, and certainly uh, heading into the 2012 um, congressional elections and presidential elections, there was lots of talk about re uh, repeal. Um, that seems unlikely given the current configuration in Washington, uh, obviously. Um, but um, I have up there, beware metagoguery, um, right? This is an inside the beltway term for using uh, Medi Medicare, Medicaid, uh, medical stuff in a demagogic fashion. Uh, people do this at their, own, um, at their own risk. And so this is a, this is a tough area. We certainly um, did not see overwhelming um, <clears throat> response to this in the 2012 um, election. And so um, this is a tough area for, uh, for politicians and one that they have to approach carefully. Uh, finally, enforcement, and I think this will be an interesting issue to think about, um, that, um, that currently the enforcement mechanism, if you don't choose to adhere to the individual, um, individual mandate requirement, is fines. Um, and so, so it'll be intriguing to see whether we see, uh, I think, uh, kind of citizen movements uh, to sort of purposefully uh, choose not to, uh, not to buy into the plan, if this ends up being an organized opposition uh, to the plan. Um, so intriguing to watch to see if we see citizen politics in this, which, which as I said before, has not been a real force. So, so it'll be interesting to watch and see um, what we see on the um, American um, activity by the American public uh, going forward. 
So in a nutshell, um, uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of history, a little bit of where we are now, and uh, and a little bit of where we might be in the future. Prognostication is a dangerous business, and my tribe uh, gets tricked into it a lot by the media. Um, we had um, people betting on the uh, outcome of the Supreme Court decision, and um, I thought you might find it interesting to find out that the political scientists did the worst of any profession in betting the outcome. So with that, I'll stop talking. Marjorie Schaefer, Professor of Nursing here from Bethel, and I have a few overview slides that I'll share, but mostly I'm going to spend the time that I have focusing on the nursing role in healthcare reform, which is pretty exciting, I think. So this is just a timeline, and you've really heard from that from our first speaker, but just to notice that on 214 at the stop, at the top you see state um, insurance exchanges, so Minnesota is on track for that one. <laughs> and this is kind of a um, comparison before reform and after. Um, the dark purple is um, the employer provided insurance, but you can see in the bright um, kind of turquoisey color um, how the uninsured population will decrease, and then also um, Medicaid will cover more people. There will still people be people uninsured, but it will be much, much less. This, I think, is an interesting slide looking at all of the United States and looking at the people ages 50 to 64, which is a key population, because they are the people that use health care a lot, chronic illness, um, that kind of thing. Minnesota looks pretty good on this map, but the dark ones are the ones that have the higher uninsured rate, and so they are the ones that really add a lot to the costs of health care when they're not insured. Um, here is some more data about um, adults who have tried to buy insurance but were turned down. They don't have the employer insurance. And you can see what happens, that it's very difficult for them to get insurance. They're turned down, and when they don't get the care they need, they end up costing the health care system more because they become even more chronic and more issues happen. Um, you heard about the Minsure Exchange in Minnesota, so I'm not going to go into more detail on that. Um, another thing that you'll be hearing about is the health care um, home or medical home, and it's an approach to primary care. We do have those in Minnesota. I think we have quite a few people that are going to clinics where everybody works together to provide the health care, and it's very well coordinated. And so people will go home from the hospital, and then they're followed, and they won't drop through the cracks. So this is a very good approach. Um, there are also some, along with health care reform, is payment reform. And these are some examples of where you, um, we do a lot of population-based pa um, payment already here in Minnesota. But bundled payment is interesting where um, you do all of the treatment related to a specific treatment or illness. And so it's one cost that covers everything, follows the patient from the hospital to the home. So some of these um, strategies of payment should reduce costs also. So now I want to spend some time talking about the nursing role in health care reform. And the first point I want to make is about nurse-led innovations. And there are several of those I would like to highlight. Um, one is the nurse-managed health clinics. Uh, with our um, nurse practitioners, they really can run clinics and um, manage primary health care. And then the second one is home visiting programs for low-income mothers. And the third is the transitional health care model. And you see the um, diagram on there shows the transitional health care model. But this is where master's prepared nurses oversee patient care from the hospital to the home. And this has reduced re-hospitalization rates for elderly patients with multiple chronic um, conditions. And they have better long-term outcomes. And so this reduces costs quite a bit. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit more about the home visiting programs for low-income mothers. Um, it's interesting that they have this in European countries for all families with new babies. They are followed in clinics and get home visits. Um, so very different from the U.S. where we only visit the high-risk families. But however, um, this has been written into um, the, um, the Affordable Care Act. And so we now do um, have funding um, to provide the home visitation. 
it has very, very good outcomes. The reason um, um, we have good evidence on this, and so um, what it does is it decreases premature births, low birth weight infants, infant mortality, child abuse, um, poverty, crime, substance abuse, unemployment, school dropouts, and it actually improves school readiness. These are outcomes based on research that have been shown. Um, this was originally started with the Nurse Family Partnership Pro um, Program, the NFP program by David Oles, who has done a lot of research on outcomes. And so when the Affordable Care Act was being developed, there was a coalition of about 55 um, nursing organizations that came together to really um, show the evidence and try to get this written in. And it is written in for three times it was rejected previously to that, but it finally got written in. There were some changes made, and um, one, it's broadened it a bit to um, use other programs other, other than just nurse family partnership, which I think is probably a good thing. And so they actually can use some research dollars to look at other programs. One big change from the nurse family partnership is they broadened um, the provider to um, um, possibly uh, paraprofessionals who are well trained and competent. They didn't keep the nurse in there. And so while that may be um, more affordable, I think um, also paraprofessionals may not have the full scope of knowledge and skills that are needed. And David Oles has done some research on that, and the outcomes are not as good for paraprofessionals as they are for nurses. So I thought that was an interesting outcome. So um, just a little story about what public health nurses do. I've done some research on public health nurse mentorship with um, pregnant and parenting teens that the Minnesota Visiting Nurses Association does. And um, I interviewed seven of the nurses who provide um, the home visits, and I had um, a grad student interview the teens. But the nurse told about, as she was finishing up with a client after visiting the client over a couple of years, and um, the, the mother uh, with the two-year-old, a little child that just about um, turned two, had d made this big thank you card for her, and then the child actually read out the letters of the nurse's name which shows school readiness at about two years of age. And the nurse was so excited about this really good outcome. And so in the future, um, we're going to have some very good outcomes with this home visitation. We'll have healthier newborns and shorter hospital stays, uh, less child abuse, um, and more school achievement. So I think um, that's going to be a very good thing. Um, so next, nursing involvement, is the whole idea of um, evidence and using scientific evidence for practice. So um, it's very much a part of nursing education now. Uh, baccalaureate nursing grads use evidence in their practice. Masters prepared nurses lead practice change and PhD prepared nurses design and conduct research. And so the, the outcomes, the research outcomes on the transitional care ma uh, model and nurse family partnership um, have provided the evidence that have moved these programs forward in healthcare reform. So, very important part of what nurses do. Then also, we um, are re redesigning nursing education. Um, and in a study um, in health affairs showed that um, a 10% or 10 point increase in the percentage of nurses who have a baccalaureate degree in nursing reduce um, actually um, um, the deaths in hospitals by 2.2 for every thousand patients. And then if they have complications, it's even more. And so this study figured out that if all of the, they had 134 hospitals in their study, and they've all, if they all increased their nurses, baccalaureate nurses, by 10 points, um, they would reduce um, deaths by 500. And so we really need to increase our baccalaureate prepared nurses. Um, and then we're also, we have a doctor of nursing practice, which is a doctoral degree that focuses on preparing um, nurses in practice. And so the recommendation is that we need to strengthen our partnerships with community colleges. And Bethel is actually doing that. We have, um, we're partnering with Pine City Technical College to offer a degree completion program for RNs. Um, we also have, um, are in the uh, building um, stage of a nurse midwife program in conjunction with Alina. So there are some very good things happening, and I think that we're going to really um, um, contribute to what's happening in healthcare reform. The um, next P 
piece is um, to expand our role in practice, and that's advanced practice nurses or nurse practitioners. And they can really address our primary care shortage that we're having. They can provide cost-effective care. We do have, in a number of states, statutory and regulatory bar barriers that prevent NPs, nurse practitioners, from practicing to the full extent of um, their licensure. And so that's something we need to continue working on. I think it was in committee um, in Minnesota. It didn't move forward. So, you know, that will continue to be try, uh, brought back. In California, they do have um, uh, a package of bills that would expand NP abilities to do things. So I think we'll see movement toward that, but we're not there yet. Then we also need to diversify our workforce. Um, we're looking at 33% of the population belonging to a racial or ethnic minority group across the U.S. This is only going to increase. I think by 250, it'll be 50%, 2050. Um, and in Minnesota, we are very underrepresented in terms of nurses in the workforce. About 95% of our RNs working in Minnesota are white. And so, um, and in the city and among young nurses, um, it's only slightly larger. So that's really something we need to work on. And I think in Bethel, our nursing program, we're really trying to develop nurses who uh, are working toward uh, practicing in a culturally competent way. We have a community engagement program where we have our students out in diverse settings and um, really learning to interact with populations who are diverse. The whole other area um, is embracing technology. You heard about um, electronic health records. Um, we use technology to search for evidence. Uh, we also use simulation for teaching. Um, our students, um, one of the things I had a grad student work on developing an end of life simulation where students can act, actually um, work with, um, it's actually a mannequin, but the mannequin dies and they have to work through that experience. We also worked out um, uh, a simulation with a culturally diverse pregnant teenager and doing a home visit. And so those kinds of experiences use technology to um, um, learn. Um, a big piece, and you heard about collaboration. This is going to be very important for nurses. Um, teamwork is going to be the cultural norm. Um, it's an essential competency for nurses as far as collaboration. Um, everyone has expertise, and so we all need to be part of the design of what that's going to look like. And we need to work on models of interprofessional um, education also. And then the eighth way of being involved is um, leadership. Uh, whether it be at the bedside or board, boardroom, nurses need to be involved and develop those skills. I think mentoring is going to be a very key thing that um, those of us who are toward the end of our <coughs> careers need to be thinking about doing with um, nurses who are developing their policy development skills, their teaching skills. Um, we want to make sure our new graduates have a positive experience so they will go on to influence nursing in a very pos positive way. And then finally, um, we need our nurses to be at the table with the implementation of these healthcare reform changes. So look for those opportunities, say yes when you're asked to be at, at the table and contribute and to be part of the solution. Nurses are actually in the largest professional group in healthcare. And so we can have a big voice if we step forward. Nurses are also the most trusted among all the professions. And so I think they can have a big role. The picture of um, the uh, public health nurse crossing the rooftops is, I have a poster in my office of that. And that, to me, represents uh, nurses who are determined to get the job done, and they can overcome the barriers. So I hope that's what we'll be doing. So you've heard um, of a number of examples of how nurses have been involved. We've talked about the NFP program, the tra transitional care model, and we talk about we've talked about how nurses can improve outcomes and reduce costs. And I really am excited about this opportunity for nurses to be major players in the change ahead in terms of healthcare reform. So thank you.